Hello, I'm J. Jermaine Bay of Melodium Voice Cranium, Ante, Colorado. The acronym is ANPAC. I am the Chief Judge of Costa Court. Uh, today is Class 21. Uh, what have we changed in terms of our cadence? We're starting to learn about provincial governments. We're starting to learn the distinction between Moorish nationals who have a state and those Moors or stateless Moors. So as Moors start coming into the consciousness of international law, and being what's called impropria persona. Impropria persona is only the first box. After that, impropria persona means that now you have an obligation to start understanding nation status, nation state, as it relates to politics. So now Moors must start answering the question of, what is the name of your provincial government? That is the question to Moors. What is the name of your provincial government? By telling other Moors the name of your provincial government, automatically other Moors will start asking questions. What does that mean? That tells us about status. So what have we learned thus far in studying what we call France versus United States of America? We've been studying thus far everything about status. Status is all about your capacities, and incapacities as it relates to status. And propria persona is the first box in status. So as we start to wrap up now this ICJ report, today will be the last class on the ICJ report as it relates to France versus United States of America. What have we learned thus far in these classes? What did we learn from class number 20? The bottom line is we learn because Morocco and Moors acquiesced. They were not parties to whatever was going on between France and the United States of America. The Moroccan Sultan was not, not there to talk about whether he accepts or rejects what France or the United States of America was putting on the record. We learned that the Sharif Authority was not there. We learned that the Moorish Empire was not there to represent itself as it relates to the bilateral treaties of peace and friendship of 1787 and 1836. So therefore, the ICJ, as we start to wrap this up, is struggling with a hard time trying to speak up on behalf of a party that's not present at that time. So what did the ICJ do? They stuck to the strict sense of the treaties, conventions, as well as other discovery documents that was on the record as it relates to the economic 1948 economic trade agreement that France had put on the record. But what we learned is that economic trade agreement was subordinate to treaties. It all came back to the origin of treaties. And before a treaty can ever, ever be fully ratified, what was the first step and status as it relates to that treaty? Consanguinity. What we have learned when it comes to treaties Treaties is just a political document, but it's all about status. And what is the first status before you can even ratify a treaty? Nationality. So everything is coming back full circle to who? Moroccans and Moors, as the ICJ is disclosing. If you really read it, they keep going back to the Moroccan authority. They keep going back to the Sharifan authority. Everything is about the Sharifan Moroccan authority. And through the cost of court, that's where all of the laws are enforced. So what did we learn in class 20? The bottom line is this. The ICJ said the Moors, through acquiescence, by a silent consent called tacit acquiescence, have agreed to allow the United States of America to hold on to the jurisdiction until we say rejection or objection. And how do we say rejection or objection, i.e. renunciation? of any of their jurisdiction, it starts with status. And then it goes to nationality, jurisdiction of your constitution and your state. That's the first step in understanding governance. All right? So today, we'll continue on understanding what is our mission and vision. The mission and vision is to create the United States of Morocco. So as Moors start to see other Moors out and about, start asking other Moors, hey Moor, what's the name of your provincial government? 
Morris will be a little perplexed at first. Well, what do you mean? That's the next level of degrees that the Moors have to get to now. When we start understanding statehood, that's going to change the entire game. Mm -hmm. All right? So let's finish up with this ICJ report. What is the purpose of why we're going over the ICJ report? Because as more start coming into statehood, more must understand what are the fundamentals in order for us to have a defense in dealing with other foreign powers. The first thing you learn in law is status, status of your nationality, and then jurisdiction, and through that jurisdiction, upholding the proper venue. This entire ICJ report has been about one thing and one thing only, status. So what status is the ICJ putting on the table? They're making three distinctions. They're talking about the French zone, they're talking about the United States of America's jurisdiction, and they're also talking about the Moroccan Sharif and the jurisdiction. Three different jurisdictions. Trying to identify who has the original jurisdiction. The original jurisdiction is always Morocco. But the parties must be known. And unfortunately, the parties, as it relates to Morocco and the Moroccans, were unknown at that time in Council of Court, i.e. the ICJ, in 1950 to 1952. So we'll talk about that as we wrap up today. The right hand where the mothers continue with the reading. We'll start from here accordingly. Accordingly, it is necessary to conclude that part, apart from the special rights under Article 20 and 21 of the Treaty of 1836, and those which arise from the provisions of the Act of Dallas of Ferris, to which reference has been made above, <clears throat> the United States claim to exercise and enjoy, as of right, consular jurisdiction with other capitulatory rights in the French zone, came to an end with the termination of all rights, rights and privileges of a capitulatory character in the French zone of the Sharifian Empire by Great Britain in pursuance of the provisions of the Convention of 1937. Of 1937. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, Morris, what are we reading right now? The ICJ is still taking a look at who has consular jurisdiction in the, in the French zone. Remember how this started. The ICJ said we're only looking at the French zone, it's a totally different jurisdiction. They were talking about the soil, the land of Morocco. So therefore, they're looking at the French zone making decisions, okay? This is all about jurisdiction. ICJ is trying to determine who has jurisdiction. Continue. The court will now consider the claim that United States nationals are not subject in principle to the application of Moroccan laws unless they have first received the assent of the United States government. Okay. What did we learn about the word assent? We learned that assent means a proper written instrument. That both parties have to sign. One party has to get ag agreement from the other party in order to enforce law or a contract on another party. What does that mean? A contract must have two signatures. If it's not two signatures, then that's a unilateral contract, an ex parte contract. Why are we about to start learning about assent? Keep in mind, Morris, what is this all about? We're learning how to play this chess game that France was playing with the United States of America. So Morris is supposed to watch this chess game and see how France and the United States of America are playing this out based upon the basic fundamentals of using Moroccan treaties. Moors have to learn how to use this treaty the same way France is using it, the United States is using it, and the same way the ICJ is looking at it. You got to look at it from three different perspectives. The ICJ has a perspective, France has a perspective, and the United States of America has a perspective. Moors must learn from all these advantage points as a referee. Okay? Look at it as a referee. What's happening? So what are we learning right now about ascent? We're about to learn how do Moors use ascent? So we have to look at this and understand how is assent used as it relates to a proper written instrument. Keep in mind what I've said in previous classes, class, today's class being class number 21, you go back to this subject matter as it relates to France versus the United States of America starting at class number 15. 
We have 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. We're wrapping up class number seven. Circle seven. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind and we start to read. Okay, let's continue. The French submission in this regard reads as follows. That the government of the United States of America is not entitled to claim that the application of all laws and regulations to its nationals in Morocco requires its express consent. That the nationals of the United States of America in Morocco are subject to the laws and regulations in force in the Sharifian Empire, and in particular the regulation of December 30th, 1948, prior consent of the uh, on imports not involving an allocation of currency without the prior consent of the United States government. The United States of submission in this regard reads as follows. Four, under the regime of extraterritorial jurisdiction now exercised by the United States in Morocco, United States citizens are not subject in principle to the application of Moroccan laws. Stop. <clears throat> what should we be looking for when we're reading this document? Look for the fact the United States is putting on the record some of their crimes against humanity. They just admitted on the record what? That the United States is doing what? Under the regime of extraterritorial jurisdiction now exercised by the United States in Morocco. They're admitting that they're exercising extraterritorial jurisdiction. They're admitting that they're not abiding by the treaty. They're admitting that all Moors are now Negro, Black, and colored. They're admitting that they're not abiding by what's called amity and commerce. They're admitting that they're not abiding by what's called the treaty of peace and friendship between the parties. That must be understood because of their arrogance. They want to claim extraterritorial jurisdiction. They think it's okay to say that because they think they're a conquering party. However, they just admitted for the record they're not maintaining the treaty of peace and friendship. Moors must always keep that in mind. They've already admitted their status. Continue, Mom. Such laws become applicable to the United States citizens only if they are submitted to the prior assent of the United States government and if this government agrees to make them applicable to its citizens. To the year of December 30th, 1948, not having been submitted to the prior assent of the United States government, cannot be made applicable to the U.S. citizens. The claim that Moroccan laws are not binding on the United States nationals unless assented to by the government of the United States is linked with the regime of capitulation and it will not be necessary to repeat the considerations which have already been discussed in dealing with consular jurisdiction. There is no provision in any of the treaties which have been under consideration in this case conferring upon the United States any such right. The so-called right of assent is merely a corollary of the system of consular jurisdiction. The consular courts applied their own law and they were not bound in any way by Moroccan law or Moroccan legislation. Before a consular court could give effect to a Moroccan law, it was necessary for the foreign power concerned to provide for its adoption as a law binding on the consul in his jurisdiction, in his judicial capacity. It was the usual practice to do this by embodying it either in the legislation of a foreign state or a ministerial or consular decrees of that state issued in pursuance of delegated powers. The foreign state could have this done or it could refuse to provide the enforcement of the law there was a right of assent only to the extent that the intervention of the consular court was necessary to ensure the effective enforcement of a Moroccan law as against the foreign nationals. Stop. What have we learned thus far just by reading this? Let's go back and comprehend, all right? There is no provision in any of the treaties which have been under consideration in this case conferring upon the United States 
any such right. What are they saying? Think about this like a more. What are they saying? They're saying there's nowhere in the treaty that says the United States of America gets to have jurisdiction over Moors. Nowhere. They can't prove that they, through a treaty, can come up with a discovery document called a treaty where they can even use interpretations to say that citizens of the United States of America have jurisdiction over Moors. That's number one. That's what you have to understand in the first sentence. The so-called, you see what the ICJ says? The so-called right of assent is merely a corollary of the system of consular jurisdiction. What's this word corollary? Corollary, corollary, corollary means correlation. Meaning it's assessed to. It's assessed to already something that's probably always well, well settled principles. It means that one thing follows another. Watch this. I'll explain. When you look at the treaty, what the ICJ is saying, the so-called right of assent is merely a, merely a corollary of the system of constant jurisdiction. The ICJ has already pointed out that Articles 20 and 21 have already covered assent. Why? Because the colonists already set forth in a assent document asking Sidi Muhammad permission to stay in the land. So the assent, as it relates to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, was already fully ratified by both parties. So therefore, if it's fully ratified, then that means automatically that the assent has already been addressed. There's not a matter of just Moors have to ask the United States permission to do anything as it relates to consular court, because that's well set of principles on the record as of 1786, when Sidi Mohammed signed it first in a Moroccan court in Morocco. And then the United States of America, through their legislation, passed it into their law, local law, 1787. That assent question has already been addressed. So when they say it's corollary, meaning that it correlates already to the treaties. We'll learn more about that, okay, as we continue. Right here. The consular courts applied their own law, and they were not bound in any way by Moroccan law or Moroccan legislation. Who are they talking about the consular court? The United States of America was claiming they had consular court. So they wouldn't abide by Moroccan laws. Because they had usurped the Moors. But the ICJ is pointing out, well, you were using your own law saying that you didn't have to go by Moroccan law. While simultaneously saying that you have every rights of a treaty of a Moroccan treaty. So which one is the United States? Well, we don't have to ask that question because you're already, because of your assent of the contract of treaty of peace and friendship, you already answered that question. The jurisdiction is already known. It's Moroccan original courts that have constant jurisdiction, not yours. Before a constant court could give effect to a Moroccan law, it was necessary for the foreign power concerned to provide for its adoption as a law binding on the consul, the consul and his ju judicial capacity. It was the usual practice to do this by embodying it either in the legislation of the foreign state or in the minister, ministerial of the consul decrees of the state issued in pursuance delegated powers. The foreign state could have this done or it could refuse to provide for the enforcement of the law. What's happening here? When it comes to assent, let's keep in mind, what are we talking about right now? The United States of America is claiming the 1836 and the 1880 treaty gave them jurisdiction. But they're talking consular court. But where did they get the consular court concept from? The original treaty of peace and friendship. Mm -hmm. That they're claiming now that they get to oversee because they usurped the more. So we're talking treaty of peace and friendship. But wait. They're saying now, you got to catch what the ICJ is saying. You got to read a couple of times in order to really see it. Right here, where it says, it was, it was the usual practice to do this by embodying it either in the legislation, in the legislation, in the legislation 
of the foreign state. What's happened? When the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of the year 1786 was signed by Sidi Muhammad, then at that time, under the Continental Congress of the um, Con yeah, Continental Congress of 1786, they brought that back to the United States of America and signed it into law in 1787 through their legislation. George Washington talks about this even in his letter of 1789. Let's take a look at it real quick. This will make sense to you. So George Washington's letter to C. Muhammad, December 1789. Remember, when you scroll down, he talks about legislation, them signing the treaty into law. The assent is now being signed into law. So they were asked for permission to stay in the land through that treaty. In the course of the approaching winter, the national legislator, the national legislator, the national legislator, legislation, which is called by the former name of Congress, i.e. the Continental Congress, will assemble, and I shall take care that nothing be omitted that may be necessary to cause the correspondence between our countries to be maintained and conducted in a manner agreeable to your majesty and satisfactory to all the parties concerned in it. What did George Washington say on the record? This is why the ICJ is pointing this out. They said, well, what? Back in the day when George Washington signed, watch, it was the usual practice to do this, do what? Sign laws through the legislation of your, of who? The foreign state, watch. It was the usual practice to do this by embodying it in either the legislation of the foreign state. George Washington passed legislation through their foreign state, the assent document called the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. And the ICJ is putting out, this has always been the practice. When two states come together and they put together a document, that document now must go back to the foreign state. They sign into their domestic legislation. And the Moors also put that into their legislation. Both states now have it on the record. It's called what? Acceptance, an accession, or ratification. Where does that come from? This right here is Article 2 of the Vienna Convention Treaty of 1969, Article 2. What does Article 2 talk about? This is Article 2 for the purpose of the present convention. Now we're talking A, Section A. Treaty means an international agreement concluded between states. So George Washington... The two parties, they concluded what? The treaty between the two states in written form and governed by international law. Whether embodied in a single instrument, what's the instrument? The assent document. Or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation. But here's the catch right here. Section B, ratification, acceptance, approval, and accession mean in each case the international International Act, so named whereby a state establishes on the international plane its consent to be bound by a treaty. What does that mean? Let's go back to the document. We've got to understand what assent means. The assent document is a treaty of peace and friendship. The United States of America accepted it. There's no more question about assent because they already agreed to the jurisdiction of Moors. But now suddenly get brand new. Oh, Moors got to get permission from the United States of America because you guys acquiesced. That's not true. And that's what you're going to learn about the ICJ as we keep reading. Okay, so let's take it from the top so we start understanding exactly what's happening with the ICJ saying because they're summarizing. There is no provision in any of the treaties which have been under consideration in this case confirmed upon the United States in any such right. What right? Jurisdiction over Moors and Morocco. The so-called right of assent, the so-called right of assent, is merely a corollary of the system of constant jurisdiction that the United States of America has already agreed to, Moroccan jurisdiction. The constant courts apply their own law 
and they were not bound in any way by Moroccan law or Moroccan legislation. The United States of America created their own law called statute. Before a consular court could give effect to a Moroccan law, it was necessary for the foreign power concerned to provide for its adoption as a law binding on the consular in, in his judicial capacity. So the United States of America said, more got to get permission from the United States of America in order to be able to enforce their Moroccan laws on the foreign powers, i.e. the Christian powers. It was usual practice to do this by embodying it in either in the legislation of the foreign state or in the ministerial or consular decrees of that state issued in pursuance of the delegated powers. The foreign state could have this done or it could refuse to provide for the enforcement of the law. So the United States right now is saying, well, we refuse. Divide by who at the time? Keep in mind, who's the party? France. The United States of America is telling France, well, we, we, we refuse to listen to you, France. Because they knew France wasn't who? The Moroccan authority. But they had a power attorney status, i.e. like a little vice sultan. So they knew they wasn't Moors. So therefore, the United States of America is still trying to hold on to their possession of Moors and Morocco. So there's that stall, deny, and defend the indefensible. We'll keep learning that. Watch what I tell you. It makes sense to you in just a moment. Go ahead, Mother. In the absence of any treaty provisions dealing with this matter, it has been contended that a right of assent can be based on custom, usage, or practice. It is unnecessary to repeat the reasons which have been given for, the re for rejecting custom, usage, and practice as a basis for extended consular jurisdiction and which are largely applicable to the right of assent. It is, however, necessary to point out that the very large number of instances in which Moroccan laws were referred to the United States authorities can readily be explained as a convenient way of ensuring their cooperation in... In, in cooperation. In co cooperation in ministerial decrees binding upon the consular courts. In that way, and in that way only, could these laws be made enforceable as against United States nationals, so long as the extended consular jurisdiction was being exercised. All right. This is one of the most important articles as it relates to consular jurisdiction. The ICJ just gave us the answers to the test again. They're talking to the Moors. Don't get me wrong, they're talking to these two parties too. But they're talking about the Moors in third party. All right? Let's really pay attention. In the absence of any treaty provisions dealing with this matter, it has been contended that a right of assent can be based on custom, usage, usage or practice. That's what the United States is trying to say. So what does the ICJ come out and say? It is unnecessary to repeat the reasons which have been given for rejecting custom usage and practice as a basis for extending consular jurisdiction. Why did the ICJ say that? They resummarized, saying what? You're not going to be able to just keep some perpetual law over Moors. Moors must always have a right for redress to come back to make a claim. So we're not going to be able to sit here and tell the United States of America, yeah, because of capitulation or extraterritorial jurisdiction, you get to maintain it. No. All sovereigns have a right to post the minimum per consanguinity. It is, however, necessary to point out that the very large number of instances in which Moroccan laws were referred to the United States authorities can readily be explained as a convenient way of ensuring their incorporations in ministerial decrees binding upon the consular courts. In that way, and in that way, only in that way only i'm going to explain that to you could these laws be made enforceable as against united states nationals so long as the extended consular jurisdiction was being exercised what is the icj saying let's take it from the top you gotta to really slow this down and listen this is an important article they're talking in third party that's why it doesn't necessarily make straight sense to you 
in the absence of any treaty provisions dealing with this matter, it has been contended that a right of assent can be based on custom, usage, or practice. So the ICJ is going to throw that out, talking about that whole admiralty and maritime stuff. Get out of here with that. It is unnecessary to repeat the reasons which have been given for rejecting custom usage and practice as a basis for extending cost of jurisdiction. So that means Moors never have to go back to the ICJ and argue over custom and usage again. It's well settled principles. Let's continue. And which are largely applicable to the right of a sick. It is, however, necessary to point out that the very large number of instances in which the Moroccan laws were referred to the United States. What are they saying right here? They're saying there's been some challenges to the United States based upon Moroccan laws. This has been a conflict of interest for a while to the United States authorities. It can really be explained as a convenient way of ensuring their incorporation. What does ICJ say? They're saying, listen, Morris, in order to ensure how to make the United States authorities comply, they give you the answer to the test. They say, in order to get them and their incorporation and ministerial decrees binding upon the consular courts, so in order to get the United States of America to be bound to consular courts, how do you do that? In that way, and in that way only, could these laws be made enforceable as against the United States nationals? So long as the extended consular jurisdiction was being exercised. So what's happening? ICJ is telling Morris, you got to use consular court in everything you do as a dispute with the United States of America. If you're not doing it, doing it through consular court, listen. If you're not doing it through consular court, it cannot be enforced on the United States of America. You got to catch what the ICJ is saying. You must incorporate consular court. But in order to incorporate consular court, you got to have what? A state. And you can't have a state unless you have a constitution. You can't have a constitution unless your nationality is correct based upon your status as a Moroccan, i.e. a Moor. So let's read it again. From here. It is, however, necessary to point out that the, that the very large number of instances in which Moroccan laws were referred to the United States authorities, meaning people have been having problems with the United States as it relates to Moroccan laws, it hasn't been working, can rarely be explained. What they say, it's easy to correct this problem with the United States of America. They say, this is easy to explain to y'all if y'all listen to what we're saying, code it. Conveniently do what? Conveniently do what? Create consular court and make it binding on the United States authorities. You must create consular court to make anything binding on the United States authorities because you don't have to get permission from the United States of America. They already agreed to consular court, Article 20 and Article 21 of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Mm -hmm. They already signed the assent document. Don't let them pull you or fool you, pull you or fool you into thinking you got to create some brand new document when the document is already well set of principles of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. That's what the ICJ is saying. Why are they saying that? Because Moors are not there saying it. So they're trying to speak on behalf of Moors without saying the word. They slid that in. How do you enforce jurisdiction on the United States of America? Consular court. Let's continue. The problem arises in three ways, which must be considered separately. The first is in cases where the application of a Moroccan law to United States nationals would be contrary to the treaty rights of the United States. In such cases, the application of Moroccan laws, whether directly or indirectly to these nationals, unless assented to by the United States, would be contrary to international law. Stop. Did you catch what happened? You hear what the ICJ just told the United States of America? Mm -hmm. So 
The problem arises in three ways, and we're talking about three ways which must be considered separately. The first is in cases where the application of a Moroccan law to the United States nationals will be contrary to the treaty of rights of the United States. That's what the United States is saying. We don't have to listen to no Moroccan laws. Watch what ICJ says. In such cases, the application of Moroccan laws, whether directly or indirectly, to these nationals, unless assented to by the United States, will be contrary to international law. It's contrary to international law. What does that mean? What the United States of America is saying is contrary. It's arbitrary and capricious. It's patently frivolous. You don't have, more don't have to get the United States of America's permission according to international law. Because the treaty is international law based upon human rights of sovereignty. The treaty is what it is. Why? Because it's never been renounced. Why? Because the United States of America uses it all around the world in order to maintain their mayhem. Continue, Mother, from here. And? And the dispute which might arise therefrom would have to be dealt with according to the ordinary methods for settlement of international disputes. These considerations apply to the decree of December 30th, 1948, which the court has found to be contrary to treaty rights of the United States. Let's start here. In such cases, the application of Moroccan laws, whether directly or indirectly to these nationals, unless assented to, to by the United States, will be contrary to international law, and the dispute which might arise therefrom will have to be dealt with according to the ordinary methods for the settlement of international disputes. What are they talking about? You got to bring it to the ICJ, because before it gets to the ICJ, the ICJ is going to say, you need to talk to who? Secretary General of the UN. And the Secretary General of the UN is going to say that you're trying to deal with this settlement and where? Conflict court. So international law, contrary to this international law, means that first you have to settle this dispute locally between two states before you bring it to the UN. The Secretary General at that point will make a recommendation to go to the ICJ if they can't settle it. So international law is all about a treaty. If you look at the definition of treaty, it says the first thing you see is international law. Treaty is international law. Consular court is international law because consular court is dealing with disputes of two separate states, two separate jurisdictions. So everything goes back to international law, and international law has subparts talking about treaties, conventions, declarations. In order to enforce that, you got to have a constitution that already set up your state. So let's get an understanding of the first case. The first case in this case, cases, in cases where the application of Moroccan law to the United States nationals will be contrary to treaty rights of the United States. What are they saying? This United States of America is pulling out Article 24 to talk about application of differences. Application of differences. Right? So that's the United States is using a Moroccan treaty for their own defense. That's what they're talking about right now. The United States of America is saying that someone's violating their treaty rights. Imagine that. France is violating the United States of America's treaty rights. The United States of America is using a Moroccan treaty for their defense. In such cases, the application of Moroccan laws, whether directly or indirectly to these nationals, unless assented to by the United States, will be contrary to international law. The United States of America is trying to say that anything contrary is notwithstanding. Imagine that. Anything contrary to the Moroccan treaty law is contrary because France is trying to enforce something on the United States. And then the United States of America got the audacity to go back to the treaty to say, France, you ain't doing something right because according to the treaty, it says you can't tax us. Imagine that, the audacity. Moore has been trying to get the United States of America to abide by the treaty. The United States of America is like, what treaty? While on the international forum, the United States of America knows the treaty is the only thing keeping them in existence on planet Earth. The 
Okay, let's talk about this dispute. And the dispute which might arise therefrom will have to be dealt with according to the ordinary methods for the settlement of international disputes. How do you deal with an international dispute? Dispute? Constant court. If constant court can't take care of it, then you go to the UN. These considerations apply to the decree of December 30th, 1948, which the court has found to be contrary to the treaty rights of the United States. What happened? France. We're talking France now. In the United States, France had a dispute. Did they go through constant court? No. They brought their dispute to the IC, to the United Nations Secretary General. Consul Court has the original jurisdiction. But then the ICJ turns around and throws out Consul Court of Morocco because it had been tainted, compromised. So there was no neutral party as it relates to the Consul Court of Moroccan law. So there's no Moroccan law to deal with these two separate foreign states. So the ICJ is like, how do we deal with this? Now the ICJ has got to make a decision because there was no consular court being used as the ordinary principles of what you deal with when you have disputes of state-on-state -state disputes. All right, let's continue. The second way in which the problem arises is in cases in which the, the cooperation of the consular court is required in order to enforce the Moroccan legislation. In such cases, regardless of whether the application of the legislation would contra contravene treaty rights, the assent of the United States would be essential to its enforcement by the consular court. The third way in which the problem arises is in cases where the application to United States nationals, otherwise than by enforcement through the consular court, of Moroccan laws which do not violate any treaty rights of the United States is in question. In such cases, the assent of the United States authorities is not required. Okay, let's go back to this second point. The second way, talking jurisdiction, in which the problem arises is in cases in which the cooperation of the consul courts is required in order to enforce Moroccan legislation. Did you catch that? Moors cannot enforce Moroccan laws on the United States of America without consular court. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a consular court without a provincial state government. In such cases, regardless of whether the application of the legislation will contravene treaty rights, the assent of the United States will be essential to its enforcement by the consular courts. Remember now, this is the ICJ dealing with France in the United States. They're telling France, ICJ is telling France, do you go through consular court to deal with this? Only way to enforce something on the United States of America you have to go through consular court. That's an application of difference. Did a judge, the Moroccan law, sign off on his 1948 trade agreement? And did you have a dispute and take it to consular court? The answer is no. So according to the contract, the ICJ is looking at the contract. What are the instructions, France? What are the instructions, United States of America? When you have a dispute, consular court. What should Morris learn from this? Morris, since the year 1913, at the very least, have been putting applications of difference on the record to challenge the jurisdiction of the United States of America or the United States Municipal Corporation. Were they using consular court? No. Morris now are claiming that they have Consul courts now. But if they're the consul, 
But guess what? That's called de facto. We already learned in this ICJ report, the ICJ threw out France's court. So they were claiming they had competent consul courts in Morocco. ICJ said, nah, threw it out. Moors must understand the difference between de facto and de jure. Let's look it up. Let's read the definition of de facto. Before we start reading de facto, what are we talking about right now? Status. Everything is status. Your status is either de facto or it is de jure. There is no in between. Neither real or your fake. We're talking Santa Claus right now. Santa Claus is de facto. Why is Santa Claus de facto? We're going to learn that de facto means a fact. It's a fact. Santa Claus is real. Ask a child. Santa Claus, we see Santa Claus at the mall every year. We see Santa Claus on TV every year. Some children even write Santa Claus letters and send it to North Pole. It is a fact that Santa Claus is real. But is it true? No, he's a fiction. The truth is the parent is Santa Claus. So it's a fact, yes, he's real. But is it true? No. Let's learn about Moors. How does that relate to Moors? Moors and their de facto status is Santa Claus. You're real. But according to international law, you're a fiction. You're what you call patently frivolous, arbitrary and capricious of what you're putting on the record because you're illegitimate based upon your government status. Let's prove it. Mother, if you can read de facto. De facto. In fact, indeed, actually. This phrase is used to characterize an officer, a government, a past action, or a state of affairs, which must be accepted for all practical purposes, but is illegal or illegitimate. In this sense, it is the contrary of de jure, which means rightful, legitimate, just, or constitutional. Thus, an officer, king, or government de facto is one who is in actual possession of the office or supreme power, but by usurpation or without lawful title, while an officer, king, or governor de jure is one who has just claim and rightful title to the office or power, but has never had plenary set possession of it, or is not in actual possession. All right, what do we learn about de facto? Let's think on multiple levels. Apply this to Moors. De facto. De facto means a fact. It's a fact. There's a big difference between fact and truth. In fact. <laughs> Indeed. Actuality. Factually. Colonists have these. Do they have possession or do they have ownership? These are, in fact, in their opinion, ownership. But the truth is, they don't own it because they're not a lodium. This phrase is used to characterize an officer, a government, de facto officer, de facto government, de facto past action, or de facto state of affairs, which must be accepted for all practical purposes but is illegal or illegitimate. So the United States of America is illegal, and Moors claim to have a government that do not have a constitution, state, no elections, no inauguration, no type of oath and allegiance, no flag, no seal, or what? Illegitimate because they're de facto. Yes, a fact, you got a government. But it's illegitimate government. Why? Why? Because now governments must be based upon ballots, votes, for the people, by the people. You can't be self-appointed. In this sense, it is the contrary of de jure. De jure means of truth, which means rightful, legitimate, just or constitutional. 
Mullins don't have a constitution, then you're illegitimate. You're de facto. The United States of America, in order to make them bound to the treaty, you must have consul court. You can't have consul court unless you have a constitution that created your state. If you don't have a constitution that created your state, then you are de facto. Thus, an officer, king, or government de facto is one who is in actual possession of the office or supreme power, but by usurpation or without lawful title. Moors don't have lawful title. What do I mean when I say that? International law says in order for you to get title, your title comes through what? The state. That's international law. Lawful title. All Moors have title. That's your consanguinity. But what's the lawful title? International law. While an officer, king, or governor, de jure, is one who has just claimed and rightful title to the office or power, but has never had plenary, 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 plenary. plenary possession of it, or is not an actual possession. What's happening? Moors right now, why are we talking about this? Because we're talking about the ICJ report. ICJ just told us how to have get our sovereignty back is through consular court. And as long as Moors are de facto, because they don't have a constitution, that means when we do not have the legitimate power to make a claim, let's learn about de jure. What is de jure? Just a second. All right, Bob. De jure of right, legitimate, lawful, by right and just title. In this sense, it is, a, it is the contrary of de facto. It may also be contrasted with de gratia, in which case it means as a matter of right, as de gratia means by grace or favor. Again, it may be contrasted with the sequitate, here meaning by law, as the latter means by equity, see government. De jure is a right, legitimate, lawful. What type of lawful? International law. By just title. What title? The title that you get through your constitution as officers. That's the just title. What's the most important word here? See government. De jure means you must have a government. We're, what, what are we talking about right now? Status, capacities, and incapacities of Moors is between two choices. We're talking choice again. Either you're going to be de facto or you're going to be de jure. How do you become de jure? You must have a provincial government. Toshri Bay has been teaching us its status. Moors want to be to make the United States of America bound to the treaties. Anything to the contrary notwithstanding. Then guess what? Moors have been doing things that are notwithstanding. I don't say that as a negative. We're all here seeking remedy because Moors got pain. But guess what? There is a cure. How do you cure this? It's called the renunciation, a capitulation, and extraterritorial jurisdiction, which is all in your head. When they say you got a headache, you take a pill. What's the pill? You must swallow the understanding of politics. <laughs> Status creates your capacities and incapacities. Who we been learning that from? Tashri Bay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this, Moors. First nationality. Moors has got that. Oh, we all about the nationality. But we understand as soon as you have a nationality, it comes with obligations. Mm -hmm. Obligations to what? Now stand on the principles 
of being a Moroccan, a Moor. But what comes along with that next? Now you want jurisdiction. You want to make claims? Okay, you're talking jurisdiction. What creates the jurisdiction? Creating a constitution. The constitution creates the state. But once you create the constitution, you must be cognizant to understand now you're talking about putting together politics. What's the politics? You got to put together the officers of your government, the three branches of the government, legislative branch, executive branch, judicial branch. Now you put together your ballots and you have the elections. After your elections, you have public inaugurations. After you have public inaugurations, you have your oath and allegiance to said government now put together, birth records, etc. Now you've created the state so it can function and be legitimate. Your sovereignty comes through the state. The state creates the status. State. Status. State. Stat. State. Status. State. State. State is the status. The status is the state. And appropriate persona creates now the other political documents. After his jurisdiction, we're talking now what? Venue. Jurisdiction sets up the venue. What jurisdiction? Of your state, your latitude, longitude. Once you have your latitude, longitude that's in your constitution, it creates the state boundaries. Now you're using the proper venue when there's disputes. What's the proper venue? Consular court. We're learning that from the ICJ. What do you do with consular court? You're dealing with adjudications. What adjudications? Okay. Now this is where you start studying international law. How do you enforce your rights through your sovereignty? Is what? You're dealing with judicial notice through consular court. You're dealing with judicial order through consular court. Then you're dealing with contempt of court if they're not following judicial order. Now you have an opportunity to exercise what's called Article 102 of the Act of Algeceres. Article 102 goes directly into what? Fines, penalties, confiscation on who? Foreigners. But you'll never get here if you don't create the state. The state is the most important element to what's going on right now. The ICJ is trying to give more as the answer to the test. It's comes to court, but they're not going to turn around and tell you, oh, by the way, you need to understand politics. You got to set up a government first. More have to catch this. So I'm going to go back to my question again. What is the name of your provincial government? Once more start being able to answer that question on the record, for the record, through their constitution, we'll start now to get remedy because the ICJ is trying to tell us. From the top one, please. The second way in which the problem arises is in, is in cases in which the cooperation of the consular courts is required in order to enforce the Moroccan legislation. Okay, stop. Read that sentence again, Mark. Two more times. The second way in which the problem arises is in cases in which the cooperation of the consular courts is required in order to enforce the Moroccan legislation. The second way, excuse me, the second way in which the problem arises is in cases in which the cooperation of the consular courts is required in order to to enforce the Moroccan legislation. Stop. Moors. Consul courts is required. Consul courts is required. Consul courts is required to do what? Enforce Moroccan legislation. It's the answer to the test. This is what Taj Bey has been trying to tell us. Noble Drali told us we needed what? Constitution. Tashmi Bey says what? Enforce consular court through your constitution. International law told us what? But well, we need a state. Continue. The third 
third way in which the problem arises is in cases where the application to United States nationals, other, otherwise than by enforcement through the consular courts of Moroccan laws, which do not violate any treaty rights of the United States, is in question. In such cases, the assent of the United States authority is not required. Let's read that again, Mom. The third way in which the problem arises is in cases where the application to United States nationals, otherwise than by enforcement through the consular courts of Moroccan laws, which do not violate any treaty rights of the United States, is in question. In such cases, assent of the United States authority is not required. Stop. What's happening? Sash Bay tells us all the time, Moors are not supposed to be in municipal courts. That is the truth. Why? Because the proper venue is consular court. We never asked the United States of America for permission to be in our own proper person, or in our own proper jurisdiction, or in our own proper venue. If they don't want to come to consular court to deal with their application of dispute, their application of difference, i.e. civil or criminal matter, that's their choice. The matter then becomes moot. However, if in fact, more to dealing with need to give judicial notice, then do so. Because the United States of America is obligated through consular court to settle all disputes. It's vice versa. Moore's got a problem with the United States of America, consular court is the answer. The United States of America got a problem with Moore's, consular court is the answer. There's no workaround. The ICJ is making it clear, in order to enforce disputes, it's consular court. And as it relates to assent, we don't need their permission to send out judicial notices, judicial orders, or contempt of court in order to now enforce fines, penalties, and confiscation as long as what? Our status is correct. Mm -hmm. When your status is correct, the ICJ will accept what you're doing to enforce said status. As soon as your status is de facto, then you are acting outside the law, which makes you an outlaw, i.e. de facto. But as long as everything Moors are doing is de jure, meaning you got the proper status, the appropriate persona, which now sets up the jurisdiction of your constitutional state, now sets up the venue, sets up adjudication, you go right into enforcing consular court. ICJ is telling us this. And you don't need the United States of America's permission, consent, or anything. Why? They already signed a treaty. Not once, not twice, three times. What do I mean? The Articles of Confederation, they signed the first treaty through the Continental Congress. That was number one. Then George Washington came around two years later and changed it to what? The United States of America. They have to agree again. That's the second time that these colonists were cognizant of this treaty. Then they renewed the treaty in 1836. And each time, they accepted Article 20 and 21, as well as 24. There's no workaround. That's what the ICJ is saying here. You don't need permission for the United States of America. They already gave permission through those treaties. <coughs> Let's continue. Hold up. Before we continue, please, Mother, if you can say this last sentence three times for me, please. In such cases, the assent of the United States authorities is not required. In such cases, the assent of the United States authorities is not required. <clears throat> In such cases, the assent of the United States authorities is not required. Thank you, Mother. Assent means permission. We do not need permission of the United States of America. All right, Mother. Accordingly, and subject to the foregoing qualifications, the court holds that the United States is not entitled to claim that the application of laws and regulations to its nationals in the French zone requires its assent. So what's happening? So in the French zone, 
France didn't have to get permission. And in Morocco, more don't have to get permission. Why? Because they're all talking about the same contract. What's the contract? It's the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. All three parties, who are the three parties? France, United States of America, and Moors. Talking about the same contract. They're all bound to the treaty as the supreme law of the land. All right. What we're going to do, we're going to stop here. We're not going to get into this next section to talking about the government of the United States of America has submitted a counterclaim a part of which relates to the question of immunity from Moroccan taxes in general. Why are we not going to talk about that? Morris don't need to be talking about how we're going to tax the, the Europeans right now. Let's first figure out how do we get back in appropriate persona to get our status correct to create our provincial government. We'll get back to this subsection of the ICJ report of France versus the United States of America some other time. That might be 20 videos from now, maybe 30. First, let's figure out how to get our foundation together, okay? So let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about the rights of indigenous people. As we found out, Rights of Indigenous People, Article 38. When we were reading the ICJ report, the ICJ was making mention, saying that it is customary that the foreign states go back and create legislation. This is what George Washington was talking about. Remember that. George Washington said, in the course of the approaching winter, the national legislators there are three branches of government, which is called by the former name of Congress, i.e. the Constitution of Congress, will assemble and shall take care that nothing be omitted that be, may be necessary to call the correspondence between our countries to be maintained and con conducted in a manner agreeable to your majesty and satisfactory to all the parties concerned in it. What's happening with this? The United States of America had an obligation to go back and through their government Put it into law. Why are we going over this right now? As more start to understand putting together their states, more must understand you by law have to go back and enforce section B. This is the Vienna Convention, 1969. You have to now, when you create your states, you have to go back and accept through or accession of what? Mean in which case the International Act, so named whereby a state establishes on the international plane, its consent to be bound by a treaty. All Moors, when you start to create your state, all Moors have to now come back and create, accept or the accession of all the treaties, all the conventions, and all of the declarations from the United Nations. As well as your constitution, that should go without being said. All of that is brought into your government. You must understand that all the Moors in their state must have all the treaties on file that you're going to abide by, and you're bound to that said treaty, declaration, convention, and your constitution. Why are we going over this right now? Because that's what we're doing right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Watch what the United Nations say in the Rights of Indigenous People, Article 38. Watch this. States and co consultation and cooperation with Indigenous people, i.e. Moors, shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of this declaration. What are they saying? That the, all states, the United States of America, including Moorish states, must include legislative measures. What is that? You must accession and acceptance of said declaration, convention, or treaty and make it your local law. Even though it's international, it becomes a part of your state provincial government. 
you accept to be bound by it. It can't be your mere expression. It must be a material fact on the record. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is very important for more to understand. The rights indigenous people is teaching us government. Article 40. Indigenous people, Moors, Moors have the right to ex uh, uh, access to and promote decisions through just and fair procedures for the resolution of conflicts and disputes with states or other parties, as well as to effective remedies for all infringements of their individual and collective rights. Such a decision shall give due consideration to the customs, traditions, and rules and legal systems of the Moors concerned and in international human rights. What's happening here? They're talking Council of Court. Mm -hmm. They're talking Article 102 of the Act of Algeceras. Listen. Moors have the right to access to the prompt decision through just and fair procedures for resolution of conflicts. What's the just, what is the prompt decision through just and fair procedures? That's across the court. You'll immediately, when the United States of America is not abiding by the treaty and they're breaching the treaty, you immediately go right into adjudication. What's adjudication? Dealing with this through the court. What does the court do immediately? Send out judicial notice. You have X amount of days to cure said dispute. If the United States of America or any foreign state is now still encroaching and breaching that contract, you go immediately to a judicial order. Now you say, okay, now this is the order. I gave you notice to deal with this under what's called arbitration and mediation to bring the dispute into constant court. If they fail to do so, you mean go into judicial order. What is a judicial order? Injunctive relief. The injunctive release says, stop everything you're doing, foreigner. Bring it into council court according to the treaties. They do not abide by that. You immediately go into contempt of court, and you immediately now set forth fines, penalties, and confiscations. Wait a minute. This is not applicable to de facto Moors. What am I saying? Moors, the ICJ has spoken. They said you cannot enforce anything on the United States of America unless you're using consul court. But you must be a de jure consul court. Mm -hmm. Moors claim they want remedy. Moors claim they want to fix this. My question to you, Moors, is what's the name of your provincial state government? Because as soon as you can answer that question, you're telling me now you're poised to deal with consul court and deal with the adjudication of now enforcing your sovereign rights. Because your sovereign rights under Article 102 of the Act of Algeciras of 1906 says you can now set forth fines, penalties, and confiscations. The rights of indigenous people is saying it right here. Moors have the right to access to the prompt decision through just was just, judicial, and fair procedures for the resolution of conflicts, that's disputes, Disputes with states. Because the rights of indigenous people is, ex ex is expecting Moors to understand by the time they get to Article 40, you already understand you need a state. So it's state on state dispute. Or the parties. Who's the other parties? When Moors are dealing with de facto municipal corporations, i.e., third states, or what we learn, those are the other parties, as well as effective remedies for all infringements of their individual and collective rights. Such a decision shall give due consideration to the customs. What's the custom? The treaty. What's the tradition? The treaty. What are the rules? The treaty. What's the legal system? Constant court. Of the Moors concerned in international human rights. You got an international human right to use constant court as a remedy, a recourse, redress in dealing with the United States of America, but the ICJ has spoken. 
This is the remedy. As long as you're de jour. Morris have to understand this. I'm going to ask the question again. Morris, what is the name of your provincial government? Ampat. We want all Moors to be able to tell us their acronym. We want all Moors to tell them their full appellation of their Elodio name, of their state. When Moors can proudly come out and tell us the name of their provincial government, i.e. their state, we know their paws to have full powers of what? International law. Your poise. ICJ already gave you permission to use it. The UN already gave you permission to use it. It's Article 40. Don't be afraid, Morris. It's time for us to increase our level of degrees. Like Tashri Bay said, when we're studying state statutes, when we're studying the Constitution of the United States of America, one of the first things Todd said was, we, we didn't understand the principles of government. We were so far detached First, we have to learn government. Who told us to learn government first? Noble Jew Ali. Now that Moors have learned government, understand the one, two, threes, and ABCs of statutes, enforcing the Constitution of the United States of America, it was all practice. It was all an exercise to get us mentally prepared to understand the principles of enforcing law. Now we must understand it's time to go to the next level and enforce international human rights through international law. So what you must understand, under the Treaty of Vienna, the Vienna Convention of 1969, you must have a state. Article 1, Mother, can you please read it three times for me, please? Article 1, Scope of the Present Convention. The present convention applies to treaties between states. Article 1, Scope of the Present Convention. The present convention applies to treaties between states. Article 1, Scope of the Present Convention. The present convention applies to treaties between states. Thank you, Mother. State, status, stat, stat, status, states. They're talking to us. Yes, it's a political word. It's political in nature. Yes, the word state is a middleman. It is not organic in character. You are organic. Moors are organic. But the world has changed. Now everything is through politics. The rights of indigenous people explains that to us. Let's go to it. Read it, mother, please. Indigenous Article 5. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining their right to participate fully if they so choose in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. The state sets up your politics. The politics sets up the state, but only if Moors choose. The ICJ has spoken. They gave us the answers to the test. The only way to enforce our sovereign rights is through the state. But we must understand sequential order. I say what I'm about to say with love. Moors must understand that when you start talking about that we have council courts and that you're a council and that we have consulates, a consulate is a byproduct of what? A government. Because you're talking jurisdiction. Because Moors say they checked the box nationality, they went straight into what? Jurisdiction talk talking about a consulate, but a consulate is designated by a constitution of its government. De jure seek government, but what type of government? A legitimate government.
and Moors have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political government that creates the law. Then it creates the economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining the right to participate fully, that means equal, if they so choose to do it right. Then your political, economic, social, and cultural life must come through the state. If Moors don't understand that, we will always remain to be de facto, which means we don't have a right of claim. We have a de facto claim. And the ICJ has already told the United States of America, when Moors make a claim in de facto, you don't have to listen to them. When Moors make a claim in that day, sure, you better listen up. Because they're getting ready to enforce Article 5 and Article 38 and Article 40. So what did the Moors do? Article 38. Moors are responsible for Article 38. We got to go with this, make it redundant. Moors, once they have a state, in consultation and cooperation with Moors, all states, including Moors, shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures. Accession, acceptance of your own law. You can't enforce law if you don't have no laws, Moors, in your state. To achieve the ends of this declaration, you must have your own laws. But once you have your own laws, Moors, let's make this redundant. United Nations has given us permission to move forward and enforcing said law. Well, what is that law? Moors have the right to assess, excuse me, access, either one, <laughs> assess to the prop decision through just and fair procedures. What makes you just and fair? Being de jure. For the resolution of conflicts, Moors want resolution of conflicts, Moors want to get rid of their pain, be de jure. To deal with what? Disputes with states or other parties, municipal corporations, as well as to effective remedies for all infringements of their individual and collective rights. See, effective remedies, you want effective remedies? Be de jure. Have a provincial government. You need a state. Such a decision shall give due consideration to the customs. You see what the I see, uh, United Nations is saying? Such a decision shall give due consideration to the customs. The United Nations is saying what? We're going to back you, Morris, because you're maintaining the customs and traditions and rules of the legal system. What's the legal system? Cost of court. Of the Moors that are concerned as long as they're using international human rights through international law. So Moors, we must be de jure. What is the name of your provincial government? I am with that.